In this video, I'm discussing eight common wine collecting mistakes, and I'm not going to mess around today, so let's get right into it. The first wine collecting mistake is failing to try before you buy. I know it can be tempting to chase the hot new wines, especially wines that have high scores from critics, perhaps a new 100 point wine, or a wine for which you just made the mailing list and you're very excited to load up on it, but that can be extremely risky. The only good wine is the wine you like and even highly acclaimed world-class wines can be polarizing. Take Del Forno Amarone, for example. Del Forno Amarone always has high scores and is always well-received by critics. It's definitely a world-class wine, but that doesn't mean that everyone will like it. Indeed, many people I know either love it or hate it. And this applies to other wines as well, not just Amarone. And so it's very important for you to try wines and make sure that you like it, especially before you buy it in quantity. So that could mean that you seek out opportunities to try a particular wine either by the glass or at a tasting from your local retailer, or perhaps at a winery visit. If you're not able to use one of those options to try wine before you buy it, then I would probably buy one bottle just to test it out and at least do a Corvin tasting on it to see if you like it or think you might like it when it has some additional age on it. Of course, that doesn't mean they have to taste every single vintage before you buy it. If you like Lynchbage, for example, odds are that you'll like future vintages of Lynchbage as well. So I would probably just do some quick research to make sure that there are no vintage-specific problems with a particular bottle in the situation where you've tasted a particular producer's wines and enjoyed them in the past. The next wine collecting mistake is buying off vintages of wine. As I like to say, the best is good enough. When I started out wine collecting, I always envisioned scenarios where my friends and I would sit down and have these vertical tastings where we had lots of consecutive vintage verticals and tried to analyze the minutia between one vintage and the next. In addition, when I was younger, I also collected coins and baseball cards, and so I liked the idea of assembling a complete set and getting as many consecutive vintage verticals of producers that I enjoyed as I could. This meant, for example, with Dom Perignon, that I was buying back vintages going back into the 80s and even in the 70s in some instances. But unfortunately, some of those bottles, like the 1992 Dom Perignon, for example, were already past peak, and when I opened it, I found that I was disappointed. Further, as it turns out, when we do vertical tastings of various wine producers, we don't want or need consecutive vintage verticals. For example, earlier this year, my tasting group did a 12 vintage vertical tasting of Ducru Bocayou, and that night we didn't worry at all about whether or not there were consecutive vintages. Rather, we tried to seek out the best 12 vintages that we could over the past two or three decades, and that provided a much more enriching and valuable experience than if we were worried about consecutive vintages. I should also mention that while I'm generally purchasing wine with an intent to enjoy it, rather than resell it. If you are forced to sell your wine for whatever reason, you'll definitely be glad that you purchase top vintages rather than off vintages, as top vintages not only age better, they appreciate more in price, and they're also much easier to resell than off vintages. For what it's worth, I personally do have at least one exception to this policy of not buying off vintage wines, and that is with respect to Chateauneuf du Pop. I've found that Chateauneuf du Pop tends to have very high scores in ripe vintages, where the wines have a little bit less acid, and they're very high in alcohol, and they can sometimes get pruny with age on them. So for that reason, with Chateauneuf, I actually prefer to buy some of the off vintages that are ready to enjoy a little bit sooner, and which have a little bit more freshness and less of that pruny characteristic. The next wine collecting mistake is over-reliance on high scores from critics when you're making purchasing decisions. It's always nice to be able to tell someone that you're sharing a bottle of wine with that that particular bottle has a score that's in the high 90s or maybe even a perfect 100 point score. But not all scores are created equal. There are some critics that have a bit of grade inflation and have very high scores, whereas other critics could be very tough graders and have very low scores that may not sound impressive at all. So my recommendation would be to try to find a critic whose palate aligns most closely with yours. That could be either a critic that's known for high scores or low scores. If you're able to find a particular critic whose palate aligns with your own, I would just rely on that person's recommendations 
without worrying so much about what the numeric score is, or without worrying about reviews from other critics whose palette may not align so well with your own. One example of this is one of my friends really enjoys James Suckling's recommendations and has found that his palette aligns very closely with Mr. Suckling. But there's plenty of other people who think that Mr. Suckling's scores are too high and who don't like Mr. Suckling's wine recommendations, but instead prefer recommendations from critics like Jeb Dunnick or someone else. In my videos, when I discuss particular wines, my goal is to try to include as many critic scores as I can find so that regardless of which particular critic you align yourself with, you'll be able to see that score at a glance as you're watching the video. The next wine collecting mistake is overbuying. And this applies not only to your overall bottle count, but to individual producers and specific bottles of wine as well. With respect to the overall bottle count, for example, I know some wine collectors who are in their 60s and have 5,000 bottles of wine or more and are still buying more wine every week or every month. If you have 5,000 bottles in your collection and you go through a bottle a day, even if you don't buy any more wine, it will still take you more than 13 years to get through all those bottles. And if you only drink one bottle of wine every other day, it will take you over 27 years to get through those wines. So definitely consider how many wines you can reasonably consume when you're making your purchasing decisions. This also applies to individual producers and specific bottles and vintages as well. Once you get a larger collection, it's nice to be able to diversify and try a number of different wines rather than drinking the same wine all the time. So it's somewhat unusual for me to drink one particular wine more than three or four times a year, regardless of how much I enjoy it. So for that reason, I don't buy wine by the case for the most part anymore, and I'll instead typically buy three or maybe four bottles of a particular wine. Of course, there are still occasional exceptions to this, but it doesn't happen very often. I think the last time I bought more than four bottles of a particular wine, it may have been a wine like the 2016 Protatore del Barbaresco, which sold for less than $40 a bottle and was a wine that I absolutely loved and which I know is extremely age-worthy. So for that one, I probably bought a case and a half or so. And in strong vintages, I also tend to buy more than four bottles of Dom Perignon because I like to age it for a long period of time and I tend to go through that a little bit more quickly, especially once it gets some age on it. But for the vast majority of wines, I'll typically buy in quantities of no more than three or four bottles per wine. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a level four diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. Most viewers of this channel are well aware that wine should be stored in climate controlled situations such as a wine cellar or off-site wine storage. However, I'm still surprised at how many people are less vigilant when it comes to the pre-acquisition circumstances under which their wine was stored. For example, a number of people may go to the store and purchase an older vintage of wine, but it could be a situation where that particular bottle has been in the part of the store that's just on a regular shelf and which is not climate controlled, and it could have been even positioned in an upright manner where the cork is not maintained in contact with the wine. If you're talking about a Bordeaux, for example, now you might be able to find a Bordeaux from the 2018 vintage or perhaps the 2016 vintage that hasn't sold. But especially if you live in a state like Florida or Texas where it gets very warm in the summer and the store may not have their air condition running overnight, I would definitely be very careful about buying such a bottle, especially if you find it in an upright position as there's a very high risk that it could be no good at that point. Similarly, I think people also underestimate the risk of transporting wine home from the store. For example, be very careful about putting wine in your trunk, especially in the hot summer. It doesn't take very long for the trunk to get extremely warm. So definitely if it's a warm time of year and you're bringing wine home from the store, be sure to put it in the back seat where it's subject to the air conditioning and not in the trunk where it could get to temperatures of more than 100 degrees or so. And of course, it's important to take precautions when having wines shipped as well. For example, in Texas where I live, I typically don't receive wine that I intend to age for a long period of time 
except for months through, say, mid-November until about the end of April or so. Other than that, it's generally not safe to ship unless you have a cold chain or other climate-controlled storage solution that will help it to ensure a safe transport. I also recommend having wine shipped on Monday so that it doesn't end up in a storage facility or on a truck over the weekend. The next wine collecting mistake is to buy wines through wine clubs. In the United States, visits to wineries are very different from visits to wineries in other parts of the world, such as France or other parts of Europe. In Bordeaux, for example, most of the producers don't even sell their wine direct to consumer when you visit the property. In contrast, in the United States, most wineries are all about trying to get consumers to purchase wine either through their mailing list or through a wine club when you're making a visit. Well, that's certainly understandable. I think it's a mistake for people to sign up for clubs when they have no control over what is shipped. And all too often I see wine clubs where the winery has total control over what is shipped and the customer just agrees to buy a certain number of bottles either per month, per quarter, or per year, and they don't even have any say about what wines they're purchasing. So this is the best way I know to end up with a lot of wine that you don't need or you don't want. So definitely have more say in your purchasing decisions and don't just turn over total control to someone who's in charge of a wine club. The next common wine collecting mistake is being unorganized and not having a good handle on your inventory. There's nothing worse than having a nice bottle of wine, but having that bottle end up in the back of your cellar or otherwise forgetting about it, such that by the time that you locate it, it's already past peak and it's a disappointing drinking experience. The best way to prevent that is using cellar management software. Cellar management software can be invaluable and definitely help to prevent the situation where you lose track of some of your wines. For example, oftentimes when I don't have a particular preference about what I'll drink on a particular evening, I'll run a time to drink up report in my cellar management software and then get a list of options that I can enjoy in the near term to help ensure that I'm not waiting too long to open a particular bottle. Cellar management software also comes in useful if you're trying to keep track of your costs for purposes of tax write-offs or in the situation where your collection's grown and you have wine insurance. In that instance, the insurance carrier is going to want a complete list of your collection and if you have cellar management software, it's easy to just generate that with the press of a button. If you don't and you have to generate that manually, that's going to be a major league pain in the butt and it's going to take you a very long time to create it. Just like waiting too long to drink a particular wine can be a wine collecting mistake, so too can drinking a wine too soon. Of course, people should drink their wine whenever they want to drink it, but if you're talking about a highly collectible wine, such as a first growth Bordeaux, that's capable of aging for substantial periods of time and which will become much more complex with a decade or two of age on it, in my view, it's a mistake to drink that wine, especially within the first couple years of release. At that point, it's going to be mostly primary fruit, there's going to be lots of oak influence, and it's going to have an incredible amount of structure. When I'm tasting wines from Bordeaux on Premour, for example, most of those wines are not even very enjoyable, and I definitely use the spit bucket far more frequently than I would with wines that have more age on them. They're really not even very enjoyable at that point. This is one reason why producers like Latour have begun to age their wine at the winery and hold it until they think that it's ready to be enjoyed. So for example, the current release of Latour is 2015. So this will give you some idea of how long you need to age those wines before they're even in the early portion of their drinking window. In many instances with these highly collectible wines, it's only with substantial additional bottle aging that these wines become truly special and worthy of their lofty price tags. If you don't want to wait that long, I would definitely recommend buying wines that are more enjoyable when they're younger. There's plenty of those options available as well. 